Where do I play the two? It, put it on top of the oh, one. Oh, put it on top of the one. Now you okay. turn that over. Turn that over. Now you play the 15. You can play it on just, just lay it down. Just anywhere. lay it down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, flinch. Flinch? Yeah, you see, you should have played that first rather than that. And this gives me the opportunity <laughs> to take a card off of my pile and put it on yours. Unfair. The object being to get rid of your deck. Yeah, the okay, 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 I get the idea now. What we're playing is a interesting turn of the century game that was actually invented here in Kalamazoo called Flinch. Mm -hmm. And I learned to play it just a couple weeks ago, and my children beat me soundly, so join the club. I'll remember them. Okay. It was invented by a man named A.J. Patterson, who was an employee at a local bookstore, and he conceived the idea for this game and patented it in 1902. And uh, they went into production, and it became just a national rage. And Flinch is still available. Uh, Parker Brothers took the patent over and, and sell it. So if you want to play an interesting game that was has a Kalamazoo connection, Flinch is it. That's just one of the games they came out with. Here's another one called Rudels. Rudels. And I don't know how to play this one. No, there was another one called Whisk that they Whisk. came out with. Yes. And we made a lot of playing cards here in Kalamazoo, didn't we, Larry? There were several companies. The American Playing Card Company made golf cards. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I guess this is just one of the things that people at the turn of the century mm -hmm. here in Kalamazoo had to do with their leisure time, mm -hmm. recreation. Uh, they didn't have as much leisure time as we do nowadays. And the range of things available for them to do was not as great. So they stayed home a lot and played games like this. Now, this is another sort of uh, turn of the century game, actually from the 1880s. It's sort of uh, a trivial pursuit game called the Electric like Magnetic that. Guide mm -hmm. to History. And it has all sorts of trivial questions mm -hmm. here, and you try to answer one. And then you place this down where it should go, and the hand will go around magnetically to the right date and what was, so, what was the question we had there? And what year was the First Crusade? That's and it right. Says, it says 1657. Well, a little I bit off. Yeah, I think this is off. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I'm 100 years old, I hope I can do so well, too. But I've seen a larger one like that, too. What I have over here is something that I know a lot of people would have in their home, and that is a, a stereoscope. Stereographs were really the rage of the late 19th century. And one thing I found interesting, Larry, with the whole concept of stereographs is the pictures look like they're exact, like they're the exact same. But in reality, it was taken with a camera, two lenses, and the lenses were three and a half inches apart because it, it takes in consideration that supposedly how the uh, distance between your eyes. Oh, yeah. And so when you would hold it up like this, and I'm looking at a, a picture of Bronson Park, and after you focused it in, it actually did look like 3D, sort of like the Viewmaster when I was growing up. Yeah. Another thing I have here, too, is another thing that, that um, was originally invented in 1843, but was really popular around the uh, late 19th century during the Victorian times, which is what we're talking about, and that is the magic lantern. Um, they would have had either gas later on, this one right here, I don't have the light source in it, but they changed to electricity and it would project images uh, on, yeah. on the wall and uh, sort of a, called it a magic lantern. In fact, when this was first made back in the 16th century, it was made by a priest and they almost thought that it had a little magical qualities to it. Hmm. Sort of uh, the 19th century version of television. That's right, that's right. Another thing uh, I, I've had fun reading up on that they did is called tableaus. Mm -hmm. That would be where the curtain would come down, like they do it at home or on a stage like this, and people would arrange themselves almost like uh, at the Wax Museum, an interesting to blow a scene from history. And then the curtain would go up, and there they'd stand. They didn't move. It was sort of a play where everyone was a statue, and the curtain would go down. That'd be the end and of it. And then the people would have yeah. to guess what that was, right? Yes. They are. Almost, almost like charades, almost, yeah. something like that. So, so people made do with, with uh, whatever was available back then. Mm -hmm. Of course, music was very important in the home and, and in the public. And sheet music uh, played on uh, a piano similar to that or melodions and things like that. And of course, melodions we made in Kalamazoo. That's right. And we made sheet music in Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo as a matter of fact. Now, very, it was very common to bind up the sheet music in a book, something like this, to preserve it. Mm -hmm. And this is a book of Civil War sheet music predominantly, but nestled in here we find Bright Kalamazoo, Song and Chorus, written by W.H. Woodhams, published in Chicago. Now, W.H. Woodhams was uh, one of the partners of a local music store, mm -hmm. and it, this was uh, published in 1864. 
And if you read the song, you can see why it didn't become famous. <laughs> uh, it's not a very good song, Fair River, Bright River. But he does something in here which I have never seen anyone else. He claims that K Kalamazoo is the Ottawa word for the present site of the village of Kalamazoo. It means Great Smoky Town. So we, we've had some strange music come out of Kalamazoo in addition to I've Got a Gale from Kalamazoo. <laughs> but that, like you said, is another thing people would do is, is stay at home and, and play music. But you know, Larry, we're talking about, too, we'd like to go back to the early years when Kalamazoo first got started in the 1830s and the kinds of things that they did for entertainment back then. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think people, people play music now, but I don't think they would do what they used to do back then. No, they wouldn't. Uh, the, the pioneer days, of course, now pioneers, it was, uh, it was rough going. It was uh, very hard work. The days were long. They didn't have a lot of time for entertainment and leisure. Uh, but now and then they did, had to. They took time off. Uh, usually in the form of getting together for a bee or some sort of a communal work-related task, a husking bee, a harvesting bee. Uh, they would get together to help one another raise their barns and log cabins mm -hmm. and things like that. And an important element of all these affairs was alcohol. The host always had to have plenty of jugs of alcohol for all the workmen that had come together to do this for nothing. As a result, some of these festivities turned into uh, bad times when people got uh, inebriated and fell off the barn they were putting up. Um, but uh, the, the corn husking bees were another interesting thing, and of course, Many of these were an occasion for uh, people to meet their future wives and things like that. Uh, if you were husking corn and you found an ear of Indian corn, that entitled mm -hmm. you to kiss your favorite that was there at the same time. You know, one of the things that, that we take for granted, I think, are libraries, especially free public yes. libraries that we have here in Kalamazoo. And during those early years uh, in the 1830s and 1840s and 50s, there were there was no such thing as a free public library where people could go get books. There was, of course, the Ladies' Library Association, which had been founded in 1852, mm -hmm. but of course you had to be a member to use their library. Then there was the Young Men's Library Association, which was started in 1859, but that was the, the case. And even there was a library uh, that was connected with the schools but you had to be a student of the schools or a parent of someone, a student in the schools to use it. And finally, in 1872, a woman by the name of Jenny Wolcott, uh, who was the librarian at the time, got paid $100 a year, which I think was quite a sizable salary back then, uh, convinced the school board to open the library up to the public, which they did mm -hmm. in 1872. So mm -hmm. I think that was really, really something too. But when we talk about libraries and reading and education, another thing too is a form of entertainment for people was the Lyceum Circuit. Yes. Now I know originally uh, in the 1830s the uh, Kalamazoo Lyceum, which was an opportunity of the village leaders to get together and discuss some issues. I know that they talk about, and I know we've never, you've never been able to verify it, that they had a debate in 1835 about whether or not Michigan should become a state. That's right. And then finally though, of course, we were visited uh, by a lot of famous people that traveled down the Lyceum Circuit. That's right. Uh, Emerson. Ralph, Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson, Emerson was here in Kalamazoo. Horace Greeley. Well, um, I've heard that Mark Twain visited Kalamazoo on that circuit. He did a lot of traveling uh, after the Civil War and came to Kalamazoo. Well, you know, Larry, with these people from the Lyceum, you're always thinking about where they would perform. And Kalamazoo didn't really have a hall for any kind of public uh, performance like this until the 1850s when Fireman's Hall was constructed on South Burdick. And uh, after that, I think these performances, whether it be a traveling troupe or a vaudeville show or whatever, uh, would perform at different halls, whether it be Fireman's Hall or Union Hall or Corporation Hall. And then finally, in the 1880s, Kalamazoo decided they needed a building directly, specifically for a theater. I think the funny story is they said that they didn't want, Corporation Hall was also where the fire department was. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to go to the opera and smell the horses at the same time. So there was a company formed, and they raised money to open in 1882, which was called the Academy of Music, which stood on uh, South Rose Street, about where the Comerica Bank is right now. Mm -hmm. And that was really the, the grand theater of Kalamazoo, uh, and I think remained after that 
We had uh, buildings such as this. Well, this one, of course, was a little earlier. The one we're sitting in right now, the Ladies' Library, mm -hmm. was completed in 1879. And I think this the stage that we're standing on right now, if you could think of all the different people that would probably perform Traveling on this stage. Traveling troops, uh, Uncle mm -hmm. Tom's Cabin, and things like that. Oh, would perform here. And uh, around 1908, the Majestic Theater opened, and that was uh, a vaudeville and also motion pictures. And when motion pictures came in, I think that saw a big change yes. in the types of theaters that opened up in Kalamazoo. We had the Majestic and the Capitol and the Fuller, and, and then now the State Theater. Yeah. And then, uh, I guess, the Lyceum sort of evolved into another idea that came up in the last quarter of the 19th century called Chautauqua. Okay. Chautauqua got started in uh, Chautauqua Lake, New York State, as a Methodist sort of Sunday school encampment. But then uh, some promoters conceived the idea of taking it on the road and bringing what they called culture under canvas to the American people. Uh, even places like Kalamazoo uh, were not able to, to get all the culture and the art and the influence of fine orchestras uh, as much as they needed to. So Chautauqua brought it to the people, to the small towns. Now Chautauqua was here in Kalamazoo in 1916. I've uh, located this program. Mm -hmm. And it would be a whole week of uh, performances, artistic performances of all types. And uh, one of the ladies that came with the Chautauqua would get all the children in town together and teach them a play. So one of the final acts of the Chautauqua would be a play conducted by the, the children. But one thing that I've always found interesting when you talk about entertainment, too, is different patriotic celebrations and other anniversaries that Kalamazoo celebrate, and then that was a means of entertainment, whether it be the bicentennial of, uh, or excuse me, the uh, centennial of 1876, oh, yes to the uh, celebration of Kalamazoo everywhere from its 25th to its uh, 100th anniversary, people wanted to celebrate. One, one of the uh, fairs and festivals that, that uh, I've always found interesting are things that were called the street fairs. These were planned by, you know, it's funny, Larry, you and I always uh, come across, I know when we study history, that history never really changes. No. And this is a fine example of something that began in the 1890s because during these times, people were moving away from Kalamazoo. The streetcars were here, they were moving away, and the businessmen of Kalamazoo wanted to bring people back to... Revitalize yeah, the Back downtown. to downtown yes. area, that sounds familiar. And so they planned a series of fairs in 1897, 98, 99, and they were held during the fall. And they had different competitions, and there were uh, floral parades, and there were different competitions, too. I know we have a little uh, book here that talks about, we were looking at this, a premium list. Uh, such things as if you had the, the best bushel of wheat, or the best embroidery, or the best quilt, and you would get different uh, awards for something like that. And um, I noticed that one award that was kind of humorous. Uh, for the, it was a chicken award, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Somebody got a half a case of celery tone. Celery tone, tone. And, and you know definitely what was in celery tone. Which, which was a uh, celery juice uh, tonic. <laughs> so the, the street fairs, I, I don't know how successful they were, but I think it's interesting that this was an opportunity, the ways that, and, and it was a, a weak activity in, in uh, uh, trying to yeah. get people to come back to Kalamazoo and is entertaining. I've seen some photographs of the street fairs in the 1890s that show people riding bicycles mm -hmm. and the bicycles would be covered with flowers and flags yeah, and things parade, like yeah. that. I, I, one of the things I like about the gay 90s is the fact that it was uh, the bicycle days, mm -hmm. the wheels as they called them back then. Uh, Americans uh, had just become very enthusiastic over bicycles uh, starting in the late 1880s when the first safety bikes were made. Mm -hmm. Before then they had those huge uh, uh, bone jars, they call them, with a six or seven foot wheel on them and uh, no brakes. And the only way to get off it was to tumble forward. But when the safety bike came out, similar to the bikes we know today, it just swept the nation. Uh, women, men and women, uh, children, everyone that could possibly afford a bike had one. And uh, there were bicycles made here in Kalamazoo, as a matter of fact. That's right. The Blood Brothers made bicycles. They also made one of the country's first bicycle baskets. Uh, and there was a proper etiquette for oh, bicycling. Sure. Now these are early etiquette books from the 1890s and this one actually shows a woman riding a bicycle on the cover. Each one has sections on proper etiquette. 
And you just didn't run out and jump on your bike well, if you were a lady. You mounted a bike from the left side and you swung your right foot over and did it very genteelly. And you did not go cycling uh, after noon. You went in the morning and you never ever went cycling after by noon. yourself. If you had a gentleman to accompany you, this was fine. If not, you got a maid or someone else to go with you because you just don't appear on the streets by yourself. It was unseemly. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I enjoyed most was a guide for uh, a man's duty, if he was accompanying a lady, would be to have a stout rope about seven feet long with him. And when you come to a steep hill, you would tie that to your lady's bicycle and you would and assist her up the hill. I that's think that's right. very nice. It's, it sounds those kinds of gentlemen around these days? Well, there are probably a few, <laughs> but most of them uh, have been lost. You know, we've got not only the introduction of the bicycle, but we've got the introduction of the automobile into Kalamazoo. We know the first automobile came in 1900, and, you know, before the streetcars and before the, the um, bicycles or automobiles or whatever, Bronson Park was the only park in Kalamazoo that you had any type of recreation. And to many people, I've talked to a lot of people in Kalamazoo, that was their only park. And now, because of the automobiles, now you had more parks. For example, Oakwood Park, which started around the 19, uh, around 1900 mm -hmm. or so, near the Woods Lake area, which yes. was quite a resort. Yes. Um, they had a there. pavilion out there. They had a pavilion. They had a, a roller rink, um, if anything, and they had a. Um, other things there. And it, Did the streetcar line run out the there? The streetcar line ran out yeah. there too, which, which I think helped it a lot. But uh, I know that, that automobiles had a tremendous impact upon resorting and where people would go to. Well, they did. Uh, and uh, the bicycles helped usher in the age of the automobiles because people who were riding bicycles campaigned for better roads. The, the, the roads were just atrocious at the turn of the century, uh, rutted and dusty and uh, terrible roads. And so because of their campaigning, there was a better roads movement, and we saw some better roads being put down, and this allowed people to drive automobiles around. But still, in the early days of motoring, it was very much of an adventure. It really was. Uh, the automobile came into the American consciousness as sort of a, a rich man's toy and something that uh, was rather dangerous. Uh, I have some early uh, books of humor about automobiles here. This is called My Auto Book, and intersprinkled with the humor and, and other things, we find uh, places where a person could uh, keep track of their, of their automobile, and the dates run, and those in the party, and the places visited. And then on the bottom, they have a little notation <laughs> that killings can be omitted. They, they thought that automobiles were killing all the livestock. This is one of the first books of humor. It's called Chauffeur Chaff, published in uh, 1906. And some of the humor is still sort of funny. Uh, for example, why are you so sure your wife will want an automobile for Christmas? Why, there isn't anything that costs more, is there? You know, some things have not changed. And then uh, uh, exercise. So you are going to get an automobile. Yes, answered the man who was always thinking of his health. My doctor says I must walk more. And then eventually, uh, of course, the Model T, beginning in 1908, became uh, a better car. But there was many jokes about the Model T. It, was, it would fall apart, and it was cheap. And for example, a Ford will go anywhere except in society. Now, there were cars manufactured here in Kalamazoo, as we know. And, uh, and uh, you have down at the museum, you had on display the very first car the that was here in That's Kalamazoo. Right. And where did people go, though? I know they went to Go Lake. Is there anywhere else that they would go with their automobiles? Well, they, would, they, would, uh, they had a regular little circuit. They would go out uh, Portage Street, and, you know, 16 or 18 miles was a good day's run at the turn of the century. They'd go out to a place called Indian Fields and turn around. Mm -hmm. maybe Where have, the airport is now, Yes, right? yes. Then ha have a, uh, oh, a picnic lunch, and, uh, and then come back, and that was the end of the day. And a, and a gentleman, of course, could, could, could count on changing tires at least once. You, you change the tire. The, they were very thin-skinned pneumatic tires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things, of course, are, are sports teams. And I think probably you could probably date the first sports teams in Kalamazoo to when uh, um, sports came in the United States, whether it be baseball, basketball, football, whatever, was in the 1880s, 1890s or so. Oh yeah, every, every small town and larger city had their own baseball teams. They were not paid, but sort of semi-pro teams, I, I guess. And they played the other communities. 
Now, uh, Kalamazoo had several teams. They organized an industrial mm -hmm. baseball mm -hmm. league early in the mm -hmm. century, and all the, the paper companies and different uh, Kalamazoo Stove Company and different places would uh, put out their teams. Uh, one team that they had a hard time beating, though, was the House of David baseball team. Oh, down. Uh, they were from uh, Benton Joe. Harbor, and they wore their hair long. It was a religious mm -hmm. group, and they were among the best b baseball players in the country. They appeared here in Kalamazoo and beat the local team soundly. Well, I think what we're finding out uh, today, Larry, is that there's a, a wealth of, we don't want to leave people with the impression that people in Kalamazoo just sat around, that there was no. a lot of things to do and, and uh, theater to go to, and, and uh, Kalamazoo, I guess we can say, has always been rich with uh, very, recreation and very entertainment. Very recreation and culture in particular, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, I think it it's, continues. I think it's something I think. to remember. Yes, it does continue. <laughs>